Hello, this is Rainer Koschnik from Germany, and I love alternative comics. This episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by Patreon supporters like me. Enjoy the show. <laughs> This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Peter Cooper. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode we have a great time talking with Peter Cooper. His new book, Ruins, just recently came out from Self Made Hero. But before we get to that conversation we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you'll find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover price, but often you're going to find the discounts are more impressive than that. That's right. And this month, as in most months, they have a load of bundles to take advantage of where you can buy multiple comics from the same publisher for a deeper discount than you would get if you bought those items individually. And this month, they have bundles from Marvel, DC, Valiant, and Vertigo as well. So you can check those out when you go to dcbservice.com. That's right. They always have great, di great discounts, and you can't go wrong. We use them, and you should too. Discount Comic Book Service. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there... Be sure to email them and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Andy, it was fun talking with uh, Peter, and I, I met him at SPX, and mm -hmm. I think there he had copies of Ruins, and I was tempted to talk with him there, but I really wanted to get him on for uh, kind of a, a longer special interview on the podcast, and, and I'm glad we did that. Yeah, yeah, I think as as listeners will find when they they listen to this this episode that um that a, a short interview at at SPX wouldn't have done justice to some of the ideas that Cooper talks about in this interview. Exactly, a lot of great detail. So so let's go ahead and uh, listen to how the conversation turned out. Let's do it. We're pleased to have on the Comics Alternative Peter Cooper. His new book, Ruins, came out last week from Self Made Hero. Peter, thanks for being on the Comics Alternative. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks for joining us. You know, Peter, I want to start off by asking you your, your own feelings of, of this new book, Ruins. So, now, when I read it, I got a sense that this was very different from all the other stuff that you've created, even the long-form work, such as Stop, Remember, Stop Remembering to Forget. Um, Stop Forgetting to Remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's easily forgotten, apparently. Stop, yeah, Stop Forgetting to Remember. Um, do you feel that Ruins is uh, in, in some ways kind of a departure for you or something different? Um, in many ways. I mean, first of all, I, I'm, now I'm working by the pound. The book weighs like three pounds. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's the longest form piece I've ever done. Uh, it's fiction, so rather than having the fallback of autobiography, uh, I had to create characters and 
uh, the situations are certainly based on things that I experienced or or read about, but there still is a lot of it that I had to uh, conjure up and then to figure out how to weave it all together in 328 pages. And also full color like that for that long, it took me nearly three years to do and uh, maybe f seven years of thinking about it. Hmm. So that, that, that coincides about with the um, what El, El Diario de Diario. Oaxaca, yeah, that that huh? you had done too, which also both both works cover the teacher strike in Oaxaca, among among other things. So, how did this? How did ruins stem out of that earlier work? Well, um, Diario de Oaxaca was basically my sketchbooks that I did during the two years that I lived in Oaxaca, Mexico, from 2006 to 2008. And I was sketchbooking away, and at a certain point, actually fairly late in, in maybe into the uh, second year, it dawned upon me that the material that I had been drawing about would make a great graphic novel of some sort. And I started to draw with, this, with a vengeance to capture as much of the details of Mexico as I possibly could, so that when the time came to do a longer form piece, based on this experience, I would have gotten already into my fingertips a tremendous amount of information, the color sense, the, the real, the details that really make something live, just the way the cobblestones are, the street dogs, the, uh, the plants, uh, and, and, and try and capture all aspects of, of the experience. So um, that, that was it was percolating that I, that I knew sort of vaguely that I'd want to do something with this. I just didn't have, um, uh, the, um, uh, so I, w I was just trying to, to get uh, essentially the reference material that I would need to eventually do a piece like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was, so in a lot of ways, the, uh, Diario de Oaxaca was really kind of like my guidebook for and reference material for what, became ruins. And I, re I referred back to it all the time. When I was drawing, I would look to see how something was drawn or, or and, you know, among a, a rather vast amount of reference material I got. I had the benefit of working on, on ruins over such a long period of time that I revisited Mexico um, maybe four or five times. And, and that when I, I mean, Oaxaca specifically, where, where we were living. And when I penciled up the rough for ruins, I could then go back and actually photograph very specific details that I had in mind to cover, but you know some of them were from my my memory of the place, and this way I could really make it accurate and and stage a lot of what was going on in the book. Um, but to add on to that, what I learned in doing Diario de Oaxaca or the time I spent working in my sketchbook, I wanted to transfer that quality into ruins. So although it's, it certainly is, is very drawn up and, and the, you know, the figures and characters are all very fully realized, a lot of the backgrounds I tried to maintain a quality that, that I got from my sketchbook. Now, one of the things I noticed in, in this, and, and when you were first talking about ruins, you mentioned the, the art that went into it, the color, is that the, the way you draw the characters, much more detailed, much more realistically rendered than about anything else I can remember uh, in your comics. And, and, and that helped to give a completely different tone to this story. Um, now, now, you say that this is a work of, of, of fiction. Now, in, in the, uh, I guess, the afterwards at the very end, you mentioned, I guess, um, certain, I guess what we could call them, uh, autobiographical links to the experience, that you had been there, that there's certain things you did experience. Um, how much of the fictional narrative of Ruins is based on your own experiences in Oaxaca? Um, I, I think a lot of the details are really what, what that make it a richer, more believable story come from the direct experiences I had and conversations and, uh, you know, just oddball details that, that make something seem more real. But the characters were created out of, uh, you know, the main characters, uh, Samantha and George, this couple, 
that has moved to Oaxaca for a sabbatical year, they're completely created, and they're a synthesis of probably both of them are are, are good portions of me, but um, they're also they run off in, in a lot of different directions that have nothing to do with my character. I mean, the, George is an entomologist who's lost his job. Um, Samantha, the woman, is probably closer to me in terms of she's working on a book and struggling with it, which is how I felt while I was working on Ruins, because it was really, there was a lot of struggle involved in, in creating it, and I felt all the time like, I, I wondered whether the world needed another book. I knew this was an extremely daunting <laughs> task to take on, and and every time I, I, I pondered the book for many years, and started to see it slip away, and I thought, I'm not going to actually do this book. I, I was kind of horrified to think I'm going to be one of those people that talks about the book they're going to do and then never gets to it, kind of like talks it out. But it just kept returning to my thoughts and and pushing against um, me in terms of there's so many aspects to this that are going to be interesting that even you know somebody may not like some aspect of it or I may not be able to pull off some aspect of it, but there's going to be so many other things working for it that it's just, it's got to be good in some form and worth doing. And ultimately for me, it was so much worth doing because it was the parallel experience of being in New York working in through many a cold winter and psychologically being in Mexico, which was a perfect Mm -hmm. experience as far as feeling this divided uh, consciousness because I'm, there's a part of me that's still, very attached to the time that we had in Mexico. I was there with my wife and daughter. And um, we originally went with the idea that our daughter was nine at the time, and we wanted her to get a second language and have a different cultural experience. And we all wanted to escape from George Bush world. And this was an, <laughs> this was an opportunity to, to do that. And we uh, naively thought, oh, we're going to this quiet small town in Mexico, and we'll be free from politics and <laughs> and you know, kind of overarching struggle, and, and we landed in the middle of a teacher strike, which um, is an annual event, ha- had been going on at that time every year for 25 years. But in this particular case, there was a new governor who decided instead of letting the teachers get their meager pay raise and depart, he was going to just try and forcibly push them out, skip the pay raise, and that turned their normally two week strike into a seven month event that included, I think, about 23 people getting killed and uh, barricades everywhere. And there was kind of a lawlessness while we were there that had its strange benefits because it was like the police were just MIA, but they just sort of show up periodically to attack the teachers. And um, that we managed to find ourselves moving around that and got kind of used to it. And even though it was an extreme situation, um, it it just became kind of normal life, and I, uh, I I kind of understood how people coped with places that are under that kind of strife, and it just becomes sort of day to day. And of course, something bad can happen, but I feel like that can happen in the streets of New York City. That is really fascinating because there's always been, you know, a political component to to your work going back to, you know, the stuff you did in World War Three Illustrated and and still do there. And, um, and so that for you to be, you know, already kind of a politically minded cartoonist to then walk right into a political event like this, um, it seems almost like, you know, circumstances are working themselves out for, for you to be there, to to, to have that, uh, to have the perspective that you have on it. Yeah, it was, it was funny because I realized after, a very short time that it wasn't that I was trying to get away from the politics part. I just was tired of the politics that I had been experiencing for at that point, six plus years with, with uh, Bush and Cheney and that, uh, the circumstances, you know, like I'm, uh, I'm a political cartoonist or artist or I, I, I like social commentary in my work. I would have not wanted to just draw, you know, trees and sunsets for two years uh, I like doing some of that, and I like getting the color palette in there. But that, with the contrast of say a tank or you know soldiers in in full riot gear, ended up being much more uh, engaging. And 
valuable to draw for me. And I, I you know, comics is just so unbelievably hard to do. They're, they're such a, a complicated uh, uh, art form that to do them wrapped around nothing in particular, you know, n- n- not a really strong story, I just holds no interest for me. And I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to dedicate the years I had to put in on this if I didn't feel like they were saying something that, you know, I personally felt had some value to it that, that really mattered. And um, a big aspect of, of Ruins is the story of the monarch butterfly making its um, migration from Canada down to Mexico. And, and that did dovetail with uh, the reality that uh, my daughter and I were raising monarch butterflies uh, during our time there. And we did travel to Michoacan, the state where the, uh, the monarchs arrive by the millions and got to see the, the monarch sanctuary, which was, you know, it's like a life highlight. But in the process of, of drawing their uh, strenuous trip to Mexico, I could also put into that the parallel, you know, subtext of what's going on on planet Earth and in the world environmentally that we're all subject to. And so I, you know, didn't want to be ham-fisted about it, but it's like the, the monarch will in fact fly over, say, uh, West Virginia over strip mining, and it will fly past uh, the, uh, you know, fruit pickers in Florida. And, and, you know, I had it flying across, flying across the border of, of Texas easily while, um, say, say Mexicans who are trying to uh, cross the border are finding it much more difficult. It just gave me a way to talk about a lot of different things at the same time. And that's gave it some heart and reason for me to devote that many years to uh, a work like this. Yeah, I really enjoyed and appreciated that part of Ruins that you were just describing, the the migration of the monarch butterfly, because the story of George and Samantha is punctuated with these interludes of you know, one particular butterfly, and we see this butterfly early on. I guess it's in, in while he's in, or it, <laughs> she, is it, uh, I guess it's a she, right? It's a she. It's yeah. a she, that's yeah. right, because she comes back, uh, the return uh, trip. <laughs> uh, she is tagged in uh, Pennsylvania, but we see her hovering uh, in, in a bird's eye view manner, uh, a variety of politically charged um, situations, events and that that are re- rather timely. I mean, in New Jersey, there is this poverty-stricken neighborhood, and you know, uh, passes over Harrisburg. There's Three Mile Island. You mentioned the strip mining. You know, the the Monsanto reference with the pickers down in Florida, uh, the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, and and so as the butterfly is making her way down into Mexico, you get to see, you know, some of the tragedies, some of the, uh, the political situations that we were having to live with today. Uh, but, but, but because the butterfly is hovering above everything, it's almost as if you're dealing with the situations in, uh, uh, and I mean this in a very positive way, a less engaged manner. In other words, you're, you're leaving, uh, the, the interpretation of these events, their their significance, up to the reader. In other words, there's you're not making personal statements. You know, characters involved in certain situations. I mean, that's that's what I guess we have later with George and Samantha. Um, did the monarch butterfly aspect, like for instance, over overseeing all of these world events, or at least United States events, um, did that occur to you early in the creation of this book, or did it evolve over time? Well, what I was going to have at Passover was something that evolved, uh, but the idea that the struggle to get to Mexico was would put it in in uh, passing over certain visual scenes. Then I had to decide, like, okay, well, what would they be? And obviously, I wanted I wanted that journey. It's it, it's every other chapter is you come back to the butterfly, and I also did it monochromatic and wordless which is mm-hmm. allows me to explore that aspect of comics, which I so love and that really interests me deeply, obviously from all the different areas, I, ways I've tried to use wordless comics from the system to sticks and stones to spy versus spy. Eye of the Balder. Those are all ways that I've, I've applied that um, because I really love the idea 
of using comics as language that transcends language barriers. And that fits neatly with the butterfly that transcends uh, um, any uh, borders and uh, it kind of hovering above all of all of the things as, as kind of a watcher. This was uh, also a way to kind of give some air in the story, which is quite dense when you're in Mexico and you see, you know, there's, it's, you know, very text heavy and uh, there's all these characters running around. And then every time you come back to the butterfly, it's, it's suddenly, it's a break from that. And I feel, felt like in a book this dense, it was really nice to have that as a breather. And that even accentuated the quality of the butterfly you know, floating through the story. Um, it also is a little bit of a reference. I'm not sure I was conscious of this when I did it, but I thought about it after the fact, at least. Um, one of my favorite uh, novels is Grapes of Wrath. And the way Steinbeck structured Grapes of Wrath was with every other chapter was a descriptive chapter. And so you had this story of the Jodes making their way through all these troubles. And then you cut to this this beautifully descriptive, almost poetic uh, um, chapter talking about the fields and the grapes and the, and the environment. And it, I'm doing something similar in there. And that it's, that's a happy reference for me because it, because that's such an important book to me. But as I was saying that, that comics is such a hard medium to do that I really have to have something very meaty to dig my teeth into, to, to make it, seem worthwhile to put the kind of effort that is required in order to do something of, of this magnitude. And it really had all that, those elements in it, and especially the butterfly sections, because as they, while I worked on the project, I got more and more concerned about climate change, and there was, there's more to read about that and more to, um, you know, more issues of it and more examples of how our environment is under this rather grave threat. And I, I was relieved that there was a, an element in my story that was so notably referencing that um, because I, I would have felt like, gee, am I working on this, on this project that is uh, disassociated from something that is such a grave concern to me right now? And so I really threw the kitchen sink into the, this project so that there was aspects of it that were covering all the bases of the things I wanted to talk about. And sometimes the dialogue was humorous and there was a little relief from that. Sometimes it was very dense and sometimes that it would be wordless. So I had sort of all the different elements that I like to have going that kept me very engaged in the whole process. When, when you talk about the, with the butterflies and the environmental message that you have the, the big, a uh, two-page spread that you do when Sam and George uh, arrive at the Butterfly Sanctuary has so much power to it for a lot of reasons. But part of that too is that you really you really get a sense in that that massive image that you do there, that beautiful image of what could be lost if you know the en- environmental uh, problems that are affecting the the butterflies were to continue. Well, I, I was, of course, doing a lot of reading about monarchs while I was working on this book. And, you know, one of the things I got to read about was how there had been a billion uh, monarchs, and it's down to 30 million now. Rather, That's a rather large drop. In the last 10 years, their population has waned so severely, and their, the environment where, that they pass through has been, you know, slowly getting paved over or, or plowed, and that... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm drawing about something that even as I'm drawing it is diminishing. And I, you know, having seen it, which it was, it, it's so mind blowing to be around say 11 million butterflies in one go that um, it, it, it gives you a tremendous sense of hope because you're just seeing this outrageous abundance of life that just seems like, you know, it'll, it'll never diminish but then, you know, I know entirely too well from, from, again, my readings and following this that what's, what's going on is that we may actually in our lifetimes see this population disappear. So, yeah, that, that part that, Andy, uh, you were referring to, I think that's a, it's a beautiful and important part of the book. But another, another section that I think is that, that comes right before that occurs 
after a particularly violent uh, part of the narrative, and here you have the monarch butterfly, and it's it's almost how do I how do I describe this for our listeners? It's it's almost as if we get the inside scoop on how the butterfly navigates. Um, there looks to be some kind of schematic. Uh, as she is, is making her way to the final destination where where she's impregnated and, and and that strikes me as if not the climax of of the narrative or at least the uh, the, the butterfly story then something that's close to it because it, it's at that point that the story of George and Samantha seem to come to to a point uh, or one of the important uh, turning points in uh, their time together well, what, what I was trying to do there was, uh, you know, I had these different aspects of the, what, where the butterfly, what the butterfly is seeing and passing over, and I realized what was missing, and, and that's there's actually a color shift in that section. Right. The you're seeing it from the butterfly's, um, it, it's it's the butterfly's entire point of view. So, they the uh, entomologists entomologists still don't know exactly. What guides monarch butterflies from Canada down to Mexico? And there's a, they've done all these different tests to figure out. They estimate that it's based on the magnetic uh, field from the Earth generated by the Earth. And so I was trying to, to visually show that, but also the the sun in relation to the sun, and so that this was kind of like a a way to describe the world as seen through the eyes of a monarch, not just at what it's passing over that we, we would see if we were flying next to it, but what you would see if you were the monarch and, and seeing the world. And so I was trying to bring that, that aspect into it because it's just, to me, it's just endlessly fascinating that you have this incredible journey and the, the, all these things that are going on and people who study it still don't have definitive answers to what is the guy? They even say when you when you visit the sanctuary, like don't touch any of the monarch butterfly that that are lining the ground that are dead because they're not even sure if there might be something that that is given off by dead monarchs along the way that that the living monarchs somehow identify. Hmm. Uh, you know, I don't know if like smell or or you know something that's a that's a like a a visual trail. So uh, it's it's another aspect of it that is really fascinating to me. If I had probably looked at the book uh, earlier and, and lost steam, I might have just done a book that was following the monarch butterfly and just done that journey and had that be the whole book. It had been a much shorter book. But um, I, may, I may actually yet do that because it, I, I'm a closet entomologist. I, before <laughs> I became a, a uh, super comic fan, I was really, really into insects and um, thought that entomology was going to be the way to go. But, um, but then comics dropped into my life and that eclipsed, that eclipsed butterflies. But this was a way to bring that back and spend all this time, aside from researching it, just drawing insects. Because Mexico also was just this incredible Garden of Eden for uh, you know, insectopia. And it was so enjoyable to be in an environment that was returned me to a sense and even even more and greater to my childhood where I remember going into a field that would just be filled with butterflies that's really not around much anymore. So it was it was uh, a chance for me to go back there a bit and, you know, go back in time and then just by drawing them to explore that aspect of my my interest. Well, a couple times in our conversation so far, you've said things that, at least to me, have um, kind of a, a, a teacher sound to it, a, a tone of an instructor. Uh, <laughs> and so I, it, it's interesting in that Stop uh, Forgetting to Remember begins with uh, Walt Kurtz. Um, it, it's like he's teaching uh, a course to to the reader. At least that 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 seems to be how he initially engages you uh, when we first see him. And, and I know that you teach, and so I'm wondering how your experiences teaching comics uh, inform the work that you've done since you've become an instructor. Um, well, one of the reasons why I started teaching was because 
the complicated nature of comics is there's so many different aspects of it that you have to be juggling in your thoughts when you're working on them that I knew I really needed to spend a lot of time examining and re-examining it. And one way to do that is to be, um, to, to talk to people about it and to crit work and, and be examining all those things on a regular basis. So I started teaching at School of Visual Arts uh, like 27 years ago, maybe, when I was, I actually wasn't that long out of art school when I was about, I think I was 26 or 27 when I started teaching. And, um, my, and, and I have ended up teaching at Parsons and even uh, Fashion Institute, oddly enough. And uh, I, teaching has been a way to keep, keep my hand very much in the, the reminding aspect of, of the form. And so that I, the way I teach my classes is very building block. So we look at page design, it's a whole page design, and then the elements of that. And when I teach, I have the students only work in black and white and do a single page every week. And it's actually, a, I discovered, now that now I'm also teaching at Harvard, um, I uh, had the good fortune to get contacted when pressure built there by students who wanted uh, to be doing comics for, say, dissertations. And were just they're just more comic fans in the world. And they, um, I, in the grab bag, I was asked, to uh, if I was be interested in teaching, and it landed at a good point for me to say yes, which includes commuting from New York City once a week up to Harvard, which is a you know five hour commute, and then teaching for four hours and spending the night, and then turning around and coming back on another, another five hour trip. So it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of travel for for a class, and I find myself absolutely giddy teaching, and I don't mind what's involved at all. But to, to bring it back to the point that what, it, what it's, it's really teaching really serves me in terms of that constant reminder of all the aspects that I need to be entertaining when I think of a page to the point where they're deeply embedded in, in my thinking in a way that I can do it without having to think, you know, like look at each detail and go, oh, I have to do that and I have to do that. It, it, it's now much more... Uh, by rote, and, and I, I, I will naturally tend towards thinking about how to construct a page or what I can include and think about the lettering and think about the word balloons and all those pieces because I'm always admonishing students to do the same. You mentioned the word balloons, and actually that, that raised something that I wanted to bring up because you do something really interesting with the word balloons in this book, which is give each character their own unique word balloons and even if and 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 when say george is speaking spanish or or trying to speak spanish um rather than using the kind of comic conventions for showing translated uh language you just switch his uh the color of his his font to green um and so i was wondering what what decisions went into make or what what went into making the decisions to use those different uh, word balloons and fonts and so on for each character. Well, I, I mean, it's not original to me to do that. I, I have seen that aspects of that before, and I've done that myself um, with, in, in comics uh, uh, using different type fonts. Uh, I did that in Metamorphosis also. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I did the each person had their own separate word balloon and separate font. Um, and and I really like the quality of giving somebody a tone of voice by virtue of their, their letter form. And um, that, again, it's, it's like, it's another uh, remarkable aspect of comics is that, you know, these, these are areas that are not really well trodden because, you know, generally speaking, if you read a comic, people don't do that. The idea of using different coloring, color coding in order to suggest Every time somebody said a Spanish word, it was in green for a while, and then I switch it over to being in English, when they're but green when they're speaking Spanish, and really mm-hmm. hope the reader will come along with that. And I was just trying to invent something there that would would be a way to get out of the, the issue of those little I, don't, I forget what they're called that those little two sideways V's that indicate now somebody's speaking in a foreign language. Right. Um, and I wanted to create a you know. A, 
I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned this because uh, I think only one other reviewer who's reviewed the book so far has mentioned that. And I was, I'm very happy with that invention. But at the same time, as with all of these sort of fancy footwork that I'm doing in, in, in the book, I really want it to be uh, sublimated so that a reader isn't going, oh, hey, look, he did this. And I think that I, I, I'm, I'm glad to have it pointed out, but I also am really glad if people catch on to it and say, oh, right, I get that and I understand what, what's going on here. What was sort of funny was uh, there's now a Spanish edition of the book that's just just coming off the presses and a French edition. And with the Spanish edition, of course, all the English is in Spanish. And so we had to have that discussion of like, okay, there's that now it's reversed where when the type is black, you have to understand that that's English. And that then when it's, you know, when it's, when they're speaking to each other and it's black and then it suddenly goes in green, that that would, you have, they have to catch on with that, which is maybe a bigger leap for the Spanish readers. Mm. But I'm hoping all of that will, will end up being part of it. And slowly but surely, I mean, I'm throwing Spanish into it. And um, so that I hope that a reader who's even not a Spanish speaker, an English reader who's not a Spanish speaker, will go, oh, right, I get that word, or I understand that. I mean, Spanish is really so easy in many ways as mm-hmm. far as, um, you know, you can, you can catch a lot of it, and it's so much in our culture that, uh, you know, a lot of people have a handful of Spanish anyway. So it's nice to have that be, that sort of worked into the story. Yeah, I like the different color of font that you use, the the different size of the word balloons and the the color inside of the word balloons. I I particularly appreciate the way that you create the bookseller George, another George in the narrative, (laughs) uh, where his word balloons look like book pages. Yes, (laughs) <laughs> I sort of stumbled on that very happily. <laughs> and in fact, after when I first noticed that, I thought, huh, well, maybe there's something about the shape and type of word balloon with the other characters that's revealing of who they are, their identity, and, and went back and, and started to, to try to figure some of those out. And I, I, I don't know if I noticed any as, as clear-cut as the bookseller, George's. Uh, I, just, I just thought that that was really clever. Mm. Thank you. Well, well, you know, George, the, I have two Georges in the book. That was another thing that uh, mm-hmm. I really, I stumbled on a lot of things here that were all very new for me. For example, um, I, I'm trying to define these characters and it seems very logical that, well, you want to have different names for different characters that helps identify people. But, there, but there's that reality factor that I love throwing into it where when I was trying to think of a name, for the bookseller, I already had a George character, and he just became a George also. And I just thought, oh, that's so. Um, it has that 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 kismet quality of like, well, th- you know, the character told me what his name was, and uh, I I just really I had a number of experiences like that while working on the book that I've read about happening to writers, but I had rarely had happen myself. For example, at one point, Samantha acts very awkwardly and it it, it sort of like cuts off the conversation abruptly and uh, her husband turns to her and says, wow, well that was, that was rather abrupt. And because it was, it was this sort of a, there was an abrupt moment and I was like, what does he say now? And what he says is he responds to my abrupt shift um, responding to it. And it, it, Mm -hmm. it, um, um, that was, I didn't say that very well, but the, the, the point is that, that there were these things that kind of happened, interactions with the characters that ended up being more naturalistic in ways, including having two Georges and, um, and not worrying whether the readers were going to get confused if you shouted out George that two people might turn their heads. Mm. Um, but uh, the, the, the word balloon shape, as you were mentioning, uh, George, the husband, has a, uh, a ruled very um, anal kind of <laughs> shape yeah. because that's his character. And his wife has a much more fluid, um, you know, she's, she's just a much more easygoing personality. Uh, there's a slightly more tremulous quality to the word balloon of the housekeeper. And, and um, Al, who is one of my favorite characters, who's a, a photojournalist uh, on the slide, you know, drinking and smoking himself to death. And he's got this gravelly, uh, rough-edged, word balloon that just suggests like a, a kind of tone of voice and he's 
he speaks in uppercase because he's it's kind of like he's shouting all the time. You know, when you you mentioned the different shapes of the word balloons with the different characters, and and Derek was talking about this too with uh, how how it fits with George's character. One of one of the impressions I got as a reader was I. I realized I was immediately feeling sympathy towards Sam because her, her balloons are these, you know, blue cloud, you know, cloudy, soft word balloons. And as you described, George's, George's are very rigid, um, rectangles with, uh, you know, very, very clearly lined text. Um, and that, you know, when, so when that, they're in conflict. It felt like the the um, word balloons were already kind of setting up me as a reader for how I would feel about that conflict. I, that's ideal. Well, that, that I mean, that's exactly what I was going for. The other beauty of defining characters through word balloons is that there's a number of points where I have some have their word balloons coming out of a window, and you know who's talking because you know. The blue balloon is going to be Sam, and the and the anal balloon is going to be George, <laughs> and the, uh, um, and, and the um, you know it's it's like it, it makes it a perfect uh, choice for giving me the the room to have them not visible and yet have the reader know be able to follow it without any question. And when you have close quarters of the characters where their balloons are kind of there's a back and forth, there is the. It's literally, you could just remove the characters and you're seeing this interaction between the character of the balloons. And so, I mean, again, it's just well, the beauty of comics is that all the, all those factors should be factored into the decision making or, or at least considered and can uh, provide a, a whole another layer to the story that brings the reader uh, along in a way that, again, I hope really uh, is is kind of background. I mean, I, I can't stand seeing a movie where, you know, let's say it's a handheld camera the whole time and you basically are super aware that there's a director filming it or, or there's an actor who's so obviously like, Oh, there's, you know, Jack Nicholson again. And you just can't transcend the, the actor for the, for the character. You want all these things to be, to, to be sublimated sufficiently. So the reader just fluidly moves along and isn't even conscious, even at points where there's no words, but they're having to make decisions and maybe fill in text and, and determine what's going on. Um, and my, if I do my job properly, then you, the reader, are going to just flow and get the most out of it. And also, it's a dialogue with, with you, um, which is another one of the beautiful aspects of, of comics. Um, you know, like, like people will compare cinema and comics, but comics is a very engaged form and, and watching a movie tends to be a much more passive form, you know, which isn't a put down for movies, but, but it's just the facts that you sit there and it washes over you. The comic, you have to make a lot of decisions and I depend on the reader to, uh, and if I do my job right, to not be skipping ahead and skipping over part of the story when they can in fact look from you know upper left of the left hand side of the, the book all the way down to the right hand corner on the second page and and you know sp- spoil the story for themselves you know if I do my job right I'm directing your eye and you're engaged in a certain way that that will f- you know flow properly in the order of things that, that I'd like you to and you know and that's where also the the, the process of doing this involved many, many stages where I did, uh, I wrote up a synopsis, then I thumbnailed the book really tiny, like on an eight and a half by 11 page for 50 pages of spreads. I wrote down what would happen on each page. Then on another uh, version of that, I did little teeny weeny drawings in these tiny little thumbnails to indicate what was happening. So I could plot, okay, there's going to be a tape page turn here. I don't want you to see what's happening there, if I'm going to do something surprising, I, you know, I need to make sure that your eye is not going to jump to it um, and, and say a page turn. So I have to plot all that out. Then I did these little mini booklets that were about quarter size of it. That was the whole book. And that took me four months to, to rough it out. 
And I even did all the lettering at this fairly tiny size. So I could actually sit down and read it and decide what wasn't working and make fixes. I think when I did that, I came out with 250 pages and my contract with Self Made Hero, uh, the publisher, said I will deliver roughly 250 pages. And in the end, <laughs> I delivered 328. So um, as I saw areas that needed expanding, I just went with it. Probably if I was given another year to work on it, I could have filled that time and the book would have been had a little bit more air in it and been that much longer. I probably was lucky that I had a deadline. <laughs> Um, my wife would probably kill me also if I kept working on this book that much longer. But um, and not that she wasn't loving and supportive. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, three years on a project, um, there's no way to amortize that. Comics is just, it, you know, it just doesn't work. You know, nobody hands you a million dollars and say, says, take your time. Well, it is an ambitious I, okay. I was going to say, it is a, a very ambitious project. And we were talking earlier about... Um, I guess on, on one level, two two kind of narrative strains that are going on. There's the story of George and Samantha, and then there's the story of the monarch butterfly as she makes her way down to, to Mexico. Um, but, you know, even within the George and Samantha storyline, things are kind of fragmented as well because in various places of the text – we have Samantha sitting at her computer who's doing her own work that, at least throughout much of the book, maybe maybe most of it, it's a little unclear as to exactly what she's writing because at first it seems like she's doing some kind of a work of history, but then the history becomes her own story as well that is strongly linked to the uh, Oaxaca or Mexican history. So now, was was this kind of story within a story, Samantha writing her own as they're down in Oaxaca, was this an idea of yours from the beginning? Uh, I, that, the biggest question mark over the book was what her book was going to be. At one point, I thought I would do it as prose, and I was going to try to write a whole other book that would be the book within the book. It was very meta, and um, mm-hmm. I thought maybe it'll be a, a, you know, like a, a mystery story, and... You're reading along, you know, uh, uh, which, you know, smacks of, of uh, uh, the pirate story in, in Watchmen. Um, oh, yeah. Just like having that meta separate story that references things and all. And um, that I, but yeah, I, I wasn't in, in any way thinking about Watchmen when I was working on this per se. But, <laughs> but uh, of course, I can't, I can't say that everything I've read and seen isn't part of what, you know, the way in my thought process um, so then I, I had different ways of handling uh, what that story was going to be. And then I did like very much the idea of having this book also be an introduction of sorts to Mexican history. And when I landed on this, the notion, which really was organically developed as I worked on the book, of her story um, being in- intertwined, basically her, her desire to have a child and and, and how and her own history would be overlaid in Mexican history so that, that it would give – I could talk about both of those things and it gave me the impetus to, to demonstrate that history, um, which I just – you know, I, I just love the idea of, of a reader coming away from this knowing more about Mexico and, um, and hopefully uh, having maybe more of a relationship to it the way – I experienced my time in Mexico was this, you know, place south of the border that I was aware of uh, before I lived, lived there, but what, I didn't have the kinship that I developed from living there. And now I, I, I feel, you know, I, I wish I could just live everywhere and, until I had covered the world. And then I just felt the wholeness of earth as being like, yes, I'm a member of all these different societies and not like, we have the United States here, and then there's that country there that we, you know, Donald Trump talks about, and, um, <laughs> and that you have this horrible sense of other that, that is constantly creeping in to our, our nationalistic tendencies. Um, and I love torpedoing that in my life. I love when circumstances hand me the information where I got to know so many Mexicans and learn Spanish, and so now... I had this kinship. If I only could know all languages, it would be uh, fantastic. Um, And I'm watching my daughter, 
who became, as we hoped, became fluent, and then now she is becoming fluent in French, and will, you know, per, I hope add many languages on being, she's going to be the ambassador that, that I would love to be, but probably will never get as much. Um, but because uh, my, my adult brain doesn't want to grab language the way her, her young mind does. Um, but to, to roll back, by the way, to the process of, of doing uh, this book and, and the way I tend to do other books, uh, after I did that little quarter size version of, of the book and I got through the 250 pages, that was what I had to send out to people to try and sell the project before I could get to the final. When I did sell it, um, which is after I think I went through 15 publishers before I found anybody willing to pay me enough to make it even vaguely worthwhile, um, <laughs> and um, uh, that then I enlarged those pages to print size and did a tight pencil version of that, then I enlarged that another 20%, so the book was you know 20% larger than print size, and that's what I, I, I did. From those pencils, I inked directly onto watercolor paper and did the finished art there. And then in some cases, like in the Monarch section, that's colored on the computer. Um, I use computer coloring actually as a, as a way to separate. In the beginning of the book, there's a transitional point where it introduces the Monarch butterfly and this monochromatic aspect. And New York is fairly monochromatic. And when you hit Mexico, it goes into watercolor, which is yet another aspect of comics that you can take advantage of is the stylistic ways you can convey information like that there's actually a more organic way of drawing that I have in Mexico in comparison to the way I drew New York. The, uh, the, this is your, you know, your process that you described here is, is really fascinating and a lot of the stuff you, you talked about there makes me think about a lot of your other work because so much of your work is, uh, and you know, this, this gets back to the, even something like the word balloon topic is kind of pushing the boundaries of what comics can do. And you said something earlier about how, you know, comics, the things, things, there's so many things that really haven't been tried in comics or haven't been really exploited as much, as much as they should have. And while you were talking about that, I was just reminded of the system which is really one of my favorite uh, graphic novels and just how much of that, especially when that first came out and I read it just kind of blew me away with what it was doing with the, with the medium. And, um, and so I wanted to, if, if we could talk about the system for a minute, and also because PM press just came out with a new edition of that pretty recently. Yes. Thankfully. I, I was yeah. <laughs> Well, I, there was there was a, a Columbia professor that was uh, wanting to um, uh, use it in his class, and uh, and it just dawned upon me like the book is out of print, and my heart sank. He, I think he was telling me that oh yeah, well we hand around photocopies of it, and I was like this is wrong. So I, <laughs> I managed to I, I happily with with PM Press I managed to find uh, a publisher willing to do it and also do it really in a way that. I, I went for larger page size, hardcover. Mm -hmm. I even did a little jiggering with, with the, uh, the page sequencing on it. Um, I'm kind of terrible that way, actually. Every time I revisit a project, I have a tendency to do something or other to fiddle with it. Sometimes, you know, for better and worse, if there's a new edition of a book, uh, like in the case of, of um, uh, Diario de Oaxaca, um, the Spanish edition of the book, I actually went back in and reworked a whole lot of, of the the design of it. Um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in ruins, I actually discovered a couple of things that I wanted to do better. Um, when I, when the, when the U S when the, uh, the self-made hero edition came out and I made adjustments for the Spanish edition and then, um, thought about it more and made adjustments for the French edition. So each one of them is very <laughs> modest. Tinkering, uh, but, but, uh, in, in the case of the Spanish edition, I actually did a few page swaps because it was just something that I did not catch that I wanted to do in the storytelling that was going to be a little bit back, more back and forth between uh, character stories where it would alternate pages a little bit more than I had. And so for 
uh, with fingers crossed, there's a second edition of the, the, of the English version, you'll actually be reading a slightly different book. So now you're going to send scholars on this treasure hunt here to try to try to compare the <laughs> compare yeah. the different versions and make make arguments about what the definitive version should be and and so on. Well, no, I, it's just I'm really <laughs> taking it back to the old, uh, you know, uh, death of Superman in a plastic bag. You have to buy two copies of it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so the progression of ruins is going to be analogous to the free flowing fluid progression of the monarch butterfly. That's exactly right. <laughs> Well, you know, getting back to something that Andy alluded to in terms of the system, because I do want us to talk about that a bit. Uh, you know, you were mentioning the style as an indicator of the particular comics content. I mean, I, I really like the the kind of spray painted stencil look of of the system because yeah. that captures, uh, you know, n- not only the setting but the, I guess, the tone of of what's going on in the system. Um, so, and, and, and where did that idea come from? Um, the first, well, I, uh, Seth Tabachman introduced me to, uh, my, my co-founder of World War III, uh, introduced me to, to stencils or he was doing, he did a couple of illustrations and stencils and I just looked at one of them and just a, a lightning bolt struck me that this was a synthesis between different things that I had done, which, uh, that, that I loved like linoleum prints, which is sort of like woodcut. And Scratchboard, which I did, that's how I did uh, the Metamorphosis adaptation. Um, and it just had all the factors that, that I love. Uh, there's a sort of an X factor that happens with stencils and the more physicality of, of working that way. And I, and I started illustrating that way in 1988. And I showed an illustration to an editor at First Comics and said, I'd like to do an entire adaptation like this. And I did The Jungle. In, in stencils, and it fit perfectly as being kind of a time period uh, a piece doing stencils like that. That felt like the era of the 1906 era of the jungle with the meatpacking industry and kind of a, a little Russian constructivist quality, a little German expressionist quality to it. Um, and uh, then when the system rolled around, I thought, you know, this still is it, it's a, it's a a stylistic form that's just never been applied to comics except for, in this case, the jungle. And mm-hmm. I, I, you know, can demonstrate one more way and, and being handed the opportunity to do something for DC Vertigo, I really felt like I, the, the sort of crusade that I've been on uh, to get adults to say, yes, comics, they're not just for kids anymore, and, you know, stop saying bang, zoom, blam, Every time there's a review <laughs> that that says that, yeah, um, and that that to do something that confounded people's sense of what the form had to be, and so doing a wordless book uh, as is the system, um, removing word balloons, which are always like, oh well, you know, comics has word balloons, of course, and comics has panel borders that you know there's specific kind of thing they don't tend to. Things don't bleed into one another so much, and they certainly, you know, stencil is not a format that comics are done in. Although you could probably hold up Franz Masuriel and Lynn Ward, who were doing woodcuts mm-hmm. that have this graphic nature that is, uh, you know, certainly has associations to the same kind of potency that uh, that stencils have. But just bringing that stylistic aspect into it, I I could. In fact, say I'm confounding what people uh, who are maybe putting down the form or see the stigma attached to the form will have said, you know, isn't part of it. And there there were several things that that the system allowed me to do that way. And having it be wordless and and really work on that uh, fluidity so that the reader didn't feel lost by not having the dialogue there, but in fact brought their own... A whole set of dialogue to each each character or monologue, and that they were you know you the reader are uh, putting in that whole aspect of the book, and you you have to interpret the image, imagery and then decide what people are saying, and and that's really exciting to me because it is really a communication, and on top of that, it it was an international book that could 
could pretty much with very modest uh, adjustments be, uh, be handed to, to anybody around the world and they would learn something about the American system or, uh, or life in New York or a lot of aspects of uh, our experience um, and, not, and there'd, be no, um, there'd be no language barrier. Just when when I, I remember first reading the system and just thinking about how amazingly labor intensive stenciling must must be for doing comics, and then I, I saw that you, you also did that for a while with Spy versus Spy as well, and I've seen you allude to kind of changing up from from using the stencils, uh, making some comment about lung, possibly giving yourself lung cancer from doing. Yeah comics that way Um, what what was i mean what really was that that process that you were doing when you were when you were using stencils to create your page um it a total pain in the ass i (laughs) you know i I would pencil the page photocopy it uh and you you know you often enlarged although with spy versus spy i actually worked the same size because i was aiming for it's, I use spray paint, not, not airbrush. And mm-hmm. I wanted the quality of the spray to be really visible and not have it do that old reduction, you know, where things get more fine and, and, and the process is less visible. I like the, in fact, occasionally I, I print things enlarged from my original and I really like the spray dot getting bigger. Um, so I would uh, then photocopy it, then cut with an exacto knife on a self-healing board, cut the, the areas that I wanted to be black out. Uh, or I had, this is a place where I could easily have an assistant working on it and mm-hmm. not lose any, uh, you know, it didn't stylistically shift it at all. I just, you know, couldn't. I, I actually penciled with the stencil cutting in mind where I would leave spaces so that, because you, you really can't cut through the full figure, you have to have, be able to have connectors so the paper doesn't fall apart. And they make these really beautiful, I mean, just the stencil itself is a beautiful object. Uh, then you, then I would take that and uh, wearing a, a medical rubber glove and, a, and a, a gas mask and have with a spray booth that I had in a separate room in my studio um, <laughs> that sucked all of the, the spray out and blew it out the window uh, for everybody else to enjoy. Uh, and um, then, you know, I'd spray it in red paint and then without mo- moving the stencil spray in black, usually. And that would get this underspray quality that, that took a very graphic looking image and then gave it this softness kind of rounding of the edges that made it almost look photographic. And I love that combination of things that happens. And I spray it onto watercolor paper and then I'd go back in and put the borders in in either ink or depending on with spy versus spy or in the system I put them in with colored pencil and then add watercolor and little touch ups and but I like the way it's sprayed off the page and if you look at the borders they're just they're you know they're, they're very uh, um, loose and uh, um, but I uh, share my studio now and I lost the place to go to do that I also just plain old had my fill of 20 years of spraying and felt very susceptible to it where I just, it made me dizzy when I used it. And I thought this can't be a good thing. <laughs> and also just the notion of using highly toxic material to do illustrations about, uh, you know, how we should better our, our environment seemed a little, it was a collision of, uh, the, uh, of, you know, contradictions that became a little too much. You know, I still fly in airplanes, even though I know it has a giant carbon, footprint but i uh would like to reduce that as much as i can well you know you mentioned spy versus spy and you know that is an institution within an institution mad magazine and so i'm wondering if you could tell us how you lucked into that gig um it was the strangest set of circumstances i mean in part i thought it i always thought it was because of the system it probably had maybe more to do with Eye of the Beholder, which was a wordless comic strip I started in the New York Times and then self-syndicated out to alternative papers that I did for all nine years or, or, or more and then picked it up again, in fact, and did it for a French paper, Liber- Liberation, for another two years. Um, I, I actually have a whole other book waiting to be published at some point of those. Um, anyway, uh, the editors of Mad... Um, 
needed to replace Prochias, the creator of Spy vs. Spy. He had retired. And they had a number of different people trying doing it, and it was sort of like they were doing a sort of a subversion of attempting to mimic Prochias. And they just decided that they wanted to see if they could find something that was um, a reinvention of it in some form. Well, when they called me, I was not aware of that. They just said, would you like to try out for Spy vs. Spy? And I almost said no on the spot because I'm an idiot. Um, and they sent, <laughs> they sensed that, that idiot part of me and thought he'd be a perfect member of the usual gang of idiots. Uh, and so I thought I'll, I'm going to, I cannot try to look like Proteus. I'm not going to mimic somebody else's style. I'm way too far in my career to pick that up. I wasn't sure if I even wanted to attempt it, but I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot, but I'm going to do it really in my, as my own thing. And it'll, it'll either stand or fall with, if, if I do it, it'll be my thing. And if they pass on it, I'm cool with that. So, in fact, I, I knew there was a part of me that, that almost hoped that would happen. So I did this. I did decide I'm going to do it in stencils and spray paint. How, how far away from the original will that be? And what I discovered when I did it was that, wow, um, uh, Spy vs. Spy has been an important influence on my work. It's probably one of the reasons, along with Charlie Chaplin and uh, Sergio Aragones and Lynn Ward, why I've done Wordless Comics. And uh, it just felt like it was in my DNA a bit. And uh, they, they jumped at it. It, was, it. it turned out like, oh, that's exactly what we're looking for is a reinvention of this sort. And so I sort of stumbled into it. And I thought, well, I'll do it for a year or maybe two years. And it kept coming around. And there was one crash or another that made me extremely glad to have any kind of steady job. Uh, and as a monthly gig, it's like as a freelancer, you just one doesn't tend to have any actual, uh, um, you know, steady anything. It's, it's very job to job. And uh, when I was probably starting to run out of steam, it went color. And then that opened the door on a whole lot of other possible things. And I just, over the years now, coming up on nearly 20, shockingly, <laughs> I, um, I just find, you know, it, 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 it holds a, a place in, in my uh, style and my heart. And it's kind of an enjoyable respite, a place to go that's kind of engaging with my 10-year-old self and hopefully my adult self. And I keep on trying to add different things to it, uh, looking at old comic strips like, say, Windsor McKay and, and, and uh, Harriman, Crazy Cat, um, and bringing some of those storytelling things to it, making the strip turn upside down in order to read it. And, and you know, like you have to actually turn the magazine in order to read the uh, third tier story, which I added in there, because I felt like, you know, just one, one story and a title, it just goes by too quickly with a wordless strip. So I've actually, you know, made more work for myself. But I, I can't help but think if I were a reader, I would like that. So that's... And I'm and I'm trying to keep my my game up on it and not be one of these burnt out guys who says uh, like, oh yeah, here we go again, got to do another spy versus spy. It's like I'm ditch digging or something. I <laughs> I really you know try to you know bring as much game to it as possible, and so that you know a reader is is still going to be uh, surprised, as will I. I hope. You know, you mentioned a moment ago Windsor McKay, and I'm reminded of your introduction in The Metamorphosis, your adaptation of Kafka's classic, where you point out that – and I hadn't even put the two together before, but you do a nice job of linking McKay – and and Kafka in, in 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 essence saying that you know there are two tastes that go great together and uh, and I think that's a great setup for the metamorphosis and so you know we were talking about your work on Mad uh, you know tonally in many ways Kafka <laughs> is, is is quite different uh, what what is it about Kafka's stories that, that's I guess that's such a natural fit for your style of art uh, they're dark. And they're funny, and they have social commentary, and they having Kafka's writing there 
uh, acting as an anchor for me to go totally wild with storytelling. Um, I did this uh, nine short story collection called Give It Up. And I really felt like the text was just whispering in my ear when I sat down to draw it. And it just like would, would kind of um, explode on the page. And yet having, having Kafka's text there held me down you know, or anchored the page in a way that made it so that as a reader, I knew that it still had a, a through line that, that no matter how far out I was going, I still would not lose the story thread. Um, and it was really an enjoyable exploration. And, and um, so I did nine short stories. And again, his, his writing is just so many different aspects of my own interests. And there's really a lot of humor in what he does, but really quite black humor. And um, although I, you know, sometimes laugh out loud at some of the things he has going. And then it gets into all sorts of um, uh, social commentary and the option for social commentary, even when it's not necessarily the obvious thing that the story is telling. Um, that there was a, uh, was a short story I did called The Trees, mm-hmm. and I interpreted it as being about homeless people. Um, that mm-hmm. was totally my interpretation. Uh, in the same way as my version of the metamorphosis is just my interpretation. It's, it's you know, hopefully anybody will, 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 who reads it will be introduced further to Kafka, will read the original text uh, minus my art and come up with their own uh, um, take on it and that maybe will argue with, with you know, my version. It, it, you know, I just, I, I just got to have the joy of exploring this text deeply and getting paid for it while I was, you know, basically taking a course in Kafka. And, um, uh, I didn't come out of it with any debt, which was lovely. unlike college. And, uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, and, and then I chose the style for that, doing it the whole book in scratch board because it reflected a German expressionist tone. And I, yeah. I in the same way as ruins is reflects, some some of the uh, Diego Rivera muralistic style mm-hmm. that I that I fell in love with when I was in Mexico and still and can't can't get enough of. Uh, I really try to have the style that I do any project in reflect the writing, and that that you know the writing is the thing, the story is the thing, and the play is the thing, and the, that I'm in the service of that. And even if it's my own story, I have to figure out okay, what will convey this? In Ruins, I was able to, having all these different storylines, I had diff- I have different stylistic approaches. The butterfly sections are drawn stylistically in a different way than, than uh, the sections that are with, with the, the characters in Mexico. And uh, Samantha's book is done in a stylistically different way, color, than, than the rest of the story. And when I go into Mexican history... On occasion, I go off in a different color set. So all of that is to basically, again, serve the story, what will convey it best. And with, with Metamorphosis, I really feel that that, that, those, that style, that, that much more edgy, black and white uh, graphic style was a, a really good way to represent Kafka. In relation to, to Windsor McKay, he was always dealing with with dreams and, you know, I mean, it was his whole oeuvre, oeuvre, um, <laughs> is, uh, um, is done, you know, is, is dream based and that Kafka has done this metamorphosis in a way where you really have this vague sense of like, is this a really bad dream the whole time? Mm-hmm. You know, is he, will he just wake up from it? Of course, Kafka in his, you know, his dark tendency is, is to never let the characters wake up from their circumstances, whereas uh, Windsor McKay lets them off the hook. But being a huge fan of Windsor McKay and that, that kind of dreamlike nature of his storytelling, I was able to imbue uh, the Kafka, uh, the, the metamorphosis, uh, or actually really follow what Kafka was doing. It was a way to do something, to explore an area that I love. I, I love dream uh, I, dream imagery. It's, it's my way of doing the more fantasy work that I otherwise generally shun, but I feel like it, it's a, it's a window on a whole set of psychological uh, stories that 
really interests me. And in fact, one of my class assignments is I have the students uh, do a comic strip based on one of their dreams. So I set them up at the beginning of the course to like, okay, start keeping a journal, write down those dreams. You know, if you don't have a lot of catalog dreams, you better start cataloging because you don't want to have to dream hard the week before the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really cool assignment because it, it, it gets them to storytell in a way that they might not otherwise, because if they're really true to the dream, it's not usually a nine panel grid. It tends to be very flowing and things, one thing goes into the next and the, the way the, the story is very fluid and you know, these very oddball things suddenly happen. And maybe you do use a, a nice square ruled bordered panel for a, uh, to, for the quality of somebody having a sudden shift in their dream. But maybe the whole thing feels like uh, flowing water. And, and that can be represented in the, the art. Uh, and, you know, comics do that beautifully. I'm glad that you mentioned the, the dreamlike or the expressionistic style that you employ in the, the Kafka adaptations. And, and we see this in Metamorphosis, but especially in those nine stories in Give It Up. And in fact, uh, b- before our interview, I was looking back through those stories in Give It Up. And, you know, it just screams uh, German expressionism. But I'm also looking at these stories. I'm also reminded of spy versus spy so it brings us back to what we were talking about earlier your work with mad and then there is something similar going on with the spy versus spy shorts that are almost dreamlike definitely wacky and uh um, and Kafka-esque. yeah kafka-esque about well, it's, those. it's actually that, that that's a good point it's it's true and it's probably why i've been able to keep at it for nearly 20 years um, with, you know, just on Spy versus Spy, because it does have all these avenues I can go down, and I can move them through time. I can, you know, they shape shift all the time, um, and that they get in these nightmare situations, and uh, that that uh, sometimes they get to wake up from, and sometimes they don't. In in terms of your work with World War Three Illustrated. Um, is the the next issue is that number forty six? Uh, forty six actually um, just came out, and I'm working on issue forty seven. Okay, I so did, does, so forty six just came out? Yeah, well, it came out. Not a few, let's see, when was it? A, a few months ago, um, but it's just just making its way out now. Um, and uh, that was a, a youth and climate change issue. The previous uh, upbeat issue of World War Three that I, that I edited. <laughs> Scott Cunningham was our, it ended up being called our death issue. And I was like, isn't every issue of World War III our death issue? <laughs> was that uh, number 45? That was 45, yes. Well, in fact, that was the one that we reviewed on the podcast. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right, exactly. And, you know, I'm really happy with that, that issue. It, means it was on mortality because I'm, I'm, we've been at this so long. We A lot of us have been experiencing parents dying and, um, there was a lot of stories that we wanted to tell that were autobiographical and yet tied into a whole lot of other subjects that World War III has always tackled. Um, but the next issue that I'm working on with a, a group of editors, including Seth, is climate change. We're going to do a combo climate change and Black Lives Matter. Um, and um, we're, you know, we're, climate change just keeps on being, you know, we, the current issue is on climate change and, and, and youth. And the next one is climate change. And so, like, I think we may keep finding ourselves with climate change and a second topic because it's, it's so um, absolutely – it's such an urgent topic at this point. I mean, certainly that's my, my sentiments about it. I did look – realize recently or read recently that uh, 42 cent percent of Americans um, are consider climate change something they're concerned with. And globally – it's 46%, which is just uh, tiny, you know? It's, I mean, it, we haven't even hit the halfway mark of people going, yeah, this is really serious and we really need to take action. So um, um, that, that's, that's not, not grand. Um, I actually I just did a piece for Vertigo. Uh, they have a book that they do. It's, uh, I forget what the title is, but... It basically just said, do whatever you want. You just have to have the word crack in it, K-R-A-K. Mm-hmm. And I did a uh, comic strip about uh, climate change. Oh, that sound effect series they're doing. Yeah. Yes, it's a sound effect series. So 
I have the, the, the crack that appears in there. I, actually, I, I'll, I, I'll skip the spoiler alert, but I'll just say look for a, a Vertigo story. And do you know what the title of the book is? I, I, I missed that detail when I was doing the story. But uh, it may just be crack. I don't know. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's one of the sort of oddball books they do that they just let me run wild on. And I really felt like at this moment, if I want to do a comic, it has to be about uh, climate change. And if I want to work on an issue of World War III, it has to be about climate change. And um, uh, so there's, there's a ton of things to talk about in that area. Yeah, well, I, I live in South Carolina, so I'm, I'm enjoying – I've been en- – I enjoyed my week off of teaching sure. last week due to, uh, due to climate change. So if that could continue, I'd love it. Yes, right. <laughs> That's the best of climate change. Ah, global warming. It's perfect temperature. <laughs> it's, there's no uh, – yeah. Uh, I couldn't get out of my house because of the, because of the flooding, but, you know. I yeah, could manage. Yeah, yeah there's yeah, there, there's always that little drawback, but hey, <laughs> I can swim to work now. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it may be worth mentioning that as we're recording this interview, the they are in there. There's, I guess, they're starting the first Democratic presidential debate, and I guess we're all hoping that global warming or climate change is a part of some of that discussion. Yes, one would hope. Yes. Certainly not. <laughs> Certainly not the way it was handled in the Republican debates. Um, and uh, yeah, there was the, the art article I said that was talking about the, the uh, uh, concern over climate change was associated with the Pope visiting and saying he's going to get a tepid response for his, his concerns on climate change. And I thought, mm-hmm. oh, sigh. Oh, well, <laughs> at, least, at least the Pope's talking about it. That's, a, that's some kind of plus. As a Jewish person, I'm now <laughs> newly concerned. About what the Pope has to say. <laughs> well, as a political cartoonist, uh, and especially with World War III Illustrated, are you finding the current political environment particularly rich this season? Uh, no pun intended. It's heating up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm feeling that. You know, it's like I, I really, I in fact, was, I was burnt out after. It, it kind of timed in a way where. We got back from Mexico in 2008, just before the crash, just before the elections, and I just, I was really tired of the kind of strident, foaming at the mouth uh, political art I had been doing for all throughout the Bush years, and I really was trying to figure out how to reconfigure my work to say things that were, you know, I wasn't, I didn't want to like soften my message, I just wanted to figure out a way to say it that was a different approach because I just I, I just was tired of the, the the whole tone that I had had in my work for a bit too long, and um, you know I mean that's part of the deal. I, I, I feel like I'm not. It's not like I'm losing my. Uh, uh, I'm becoming more conservative as I get older. I'm just thinking about how to convey these ideas in a way that isn't the same, you know, as I might have done previously. And, and maybe I hope with a little bit more um, uh, that my experience has led me to maybe new ways of, of communicating that will maybe change people's minds or have a better impact than something that was maybe more strident. Um, and I'll, I'll still do strident work periodically, but I, I, I'm looking for um, different ways to, to approach this and different ways to tell stories that will um, – Again, maybe confounds people's uh, uh, belief like, oh, I know what he's going to say and therefore I can dismiss it. Uh, so, but I am feeling like with the current environment, environmental aspect of it, but also the environment with people like Trump around who are rising up, that my political uh, nerves are, are, uh, have gotten uh, warmed up again and um, they're no longer – I'm not, they're not as frayed as they once were. I, got, I managed to catch my breath, and I feel like, okay, I'm ready to start doing more political illustration, which is also, having worked on a project for years and years, uh, I'm interested in exploring the dropped illustration career that, that I had, um, just because there's something very gratifying about doing an illustration today that I get to see in the paper tomorrow, as opposed to a book that I take, you know, contemplate for seven years, take three years to do, 
and it takes a year to come out. So you have your spy versus spy work. You have the World War III illustrated. And as you've mentioned, you have your ongoing editions of Ruins um, uh, as they come out. Uh, what, uh, what kind of long-term project are you working on or do you have in mind right now? Um, I'm, I'm uh, waiting for that one to percolate. It may, may take some time. I have a couple of different ideas for longer form things, but then it crosses my mind that I may not need to just dive straight into another long form piece just yet. Um, I uh, worked on some animation for a documentary called Containment with a couple of Harvard professors. Of course, I have the ongoing teaching, which takes up a a, a chunk of time every week. Um, And I'm doing a whole lot of speaking and giving talks and traveling in relation to ruins. So that for the, for the next foreseeable months, I'm going to be doing um, uh, bits and pieces of that. So it's really hard to settle in on a, a single project, but I do have something in mind that, that I'm, um, I'm looking at that will in some part depend on who steps forward and says that they, you know, will make it possible for me to, to, work on it for an extended period of time. Because there's, you know, I, there's just the plain old sad financial concerns of making a living and trying to do this thing, which I am deeply lucky to have done, you know, so much of for so long. I pretty much, you know, have done what I wanted without too much compromise. And um, I love teaching. I don't do it because, you know, those that can't do teach. And I, uh, Spy vs. Spy is very enjoyable. I might go to fewer comic conventions because they, they really do. There's an aspect to them that uh, I could do without, but mm-hmm. they tend to be financially uh, helpful. And I also love, you know, the, it's the pixie dust that comes down from all the encounters. <laughs> I mean, I really feel like I run on pixie dust half the time because I just, I mm-hmm. got all these different great jobs, you know, like the Harvard thing came from, I don't know where. And that led me to, have contact with these Harvard professors that asked me to do this animation project. Um, and, uh, uh, containment was, you know, it was right up my alley and they had me doing, uh, visualizing the future of, uh, planet earth, uh, a uh, hundred, a thousand and 10,000 years in the future based on, uh, scientists theories that, uh, uh the U S government had hired them to come up with for what the world would be like so that when we bury this hideous, highly toxic waste, we could somehow convey to the future not to dig it up. And so I'm drawing robots and I'm drawing uh, a feminist future and I'm drawing a religious crazies future and, you know, it's a ball. And every once in a while I look up and go, oh my God, I'm, I'm drawing about our, you know, various dark scenarios. But this is one of the absolutely glorious parts of my work, which is it's a huge catharsis. So even as I'm drawing about pretty horrible things occasionally or often, I'm feeling a sort of elation because I feel like it's, it's a way of feeling like I'm not petrified. I'm not inactive. I'm doing something even if, you know, I'm drawing while Rome burns as opposed to fiddling. But it, it feels like an action. And um, I'm hoping, of course that all this has a sum total of making other people feel uh, engaged and like they might want to actually say, take some action that we'll all collectively work towards a future that we can survive in and that art will play some role in that. When I lived in Mexico, I really was, it it made me really um, optimistic in terms of how art plays into people's lives and uh, like day of the dead there, everybody's an artist and you have this incredible sense of connection to your past and your future. And art is, is very much part of that. And people are very engaged with it. And it's not like you have artists on one side and the people on the other who are the audience or, or don't do art, but really it almost feels like everybody's an artist there. And that's, it's a real dialogue. And I love the notion that art can do that actually have a reason for existing that could serve some higher purpose. 
which might might be a good ending to this interview. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, well, Peter, we do want to thank you for taking the time and talking with us uh, about ruins and and other work as well. So, you know, good luck with all of your projects as well as your events and travels. Pub- helping to publicize and get the word out about ruins. Um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to go on and on and talk about my work. We it was great. It. it was a great conversation. Thanks. Thank you. So, you know, after after reading Ruins this week in preparation for the show, I really thought that this is this is going to be one of my favorite books of the year so far. And in talking to Peter Cooper about it, I have a, a great even greater appreciation of it. Some of the the nuances that he talks about of putting into uh, what he put into the creation of the book and so on really helped, you know, even even expand my enjoyment of that work. I agree, and one of the things I really enjoyed about that conversation was the fact that Peter didn't hesitate to talk about what he was trying to do in this in, in the story. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of creators will give you some of the the history or the backstory of their creation, but they may hesitate a little bit talking about what they were trying to do. They, I think may want to leave that up to readers. But but I appreciated and got a lot out of those additional insights that he was able to provide for, for a variety of aspects of Ruins. But, you know, something that we didn't really get to talk about as much as I had wanted, and it's worth mentioning to our listeners, that um, you know, the, the package itself, the book, the physical product that I'm holding in my hands right now, Really a good job that Self-Made Hero did. This is a a, Mm -hmm. a larger book, thick pages. It has a hefty feel to it. It has a nice ribbon bookmark in it. And and Mm -hmm. the bookmark just tells you it's special. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it is is a really nicely put together book. I do have to say at one point, though, I gave myself one of the deepest paper cuts I've ever gotten off of a page one of this this book there. They're thick. Pieces of their thick pieces of paper, and I was I was really kind of alarmed at the amount of bleeding that was happening. <laughs> but oh, I, that's that's not the book's fault. That was totally my mistake. Well, maybe it's a good thing you didn't bring that up in our conversation. <laughs> Say thanks, Peter, for making me bleed. <laughs> well, you know, figuratively. Yeah. Maybe. So, but no, we did have a, a wonderful time talking with Peter. Thanks again for taking the time to talk with us. And if you want to find great books like Ruins, you will do well to go to the website of our sponsor, dcbservice.com. Go there for all of your comics pre ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know the kind of things that you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find in the right-hand side of your browser a tab that says Send Voicemail. Click on that, and from the comfort of your own desktop or mobile device, you can send us a voice message through the wonders of SpeakPipe. Ain't technology wonderful? Or if you want to do it old school, pick up the phone and give us a call. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. That's right. Or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we also have our Twitter feed where we announce new content to the podcast as well as updates to the blog. You can check out our Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Instagram, on Google Plus, and on Pinterest. And if you like using YouTube, you can find us there as well. We have a YouTube channel. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn. And you can find, as always, every single one of our episodes as well as our reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog. And that's at the website, comicsalternative.com. 
That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us and find out what we're doing. That's right. And we do like to hear from you. Uh, until next time, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.